in 1670, Charles II granted the Company of Adventures trading into Hudson's Bay, otherwise known as the Hudson's Bay Company. This charter, giving the company an absolute trade monopoly over one million square miles of land in what is now Canada. At this time in history, this vast area called Rupert's Land was exclusively occupied by the Indian and the Eskimo. The Hudson's Bay Company is celebrating its 300th anniversary, showing its corporate spirit of brotherly love and goodwill to all men. Thousands of Canadians are here, waiting in the rain to see their own history in the making. Here, too, along with the odd cabinet minister, are directors of the company and top people of Canadian society. It is a royal occasion. The Queen has come to add further prestige to the moment. By our first charter, it was ordained that we should yield two elks and two black beaver, whensoever he, his heirs and successors, should happen to enter into his territory of Rupert's land. And uh, we therefore beg your majesty to accept these two elks and two black beavers, which we now offer to you under the terms of their charter. Are you ready and willing to render your suit and service? Ready indeed, and we tender uh, to your majesty, um, uh, two... She has also come to collect the rent. ...and two beavers as the expression of our loyalty, our love, and our affection. This ludicrous ceremony is not to be taken lightly. It represents an incredible bargain made between Crown and Company, a bargain which we feel resulted in the misery, deprivation, and exploitation of Canada's indigenous peoples. To think that a king in England could just by sort of a, 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 sort of a few words give a great portion of Canada to only a handful of Englishmen. And of course, in this giveaway, they also included the Indians who lived in here, and the Indians had absolutely no say about it whatsoever. Like I was reading in the paper the other day how the government is having a really hard job trying to determine who to allow into the country, what with all the draft dodgers and all these people coming into the country, the government doesn't know what to do. And I can sympathize with the government, because unfortunately we didn't know either. Unfortunately we let the wrong ones in. <laughs> I can't place my things on any real development that the Hudson Bay has done in this country other than exploit, especially the Indian people.
During the past 300 years, the history of Canada has been written by the white man. It tells of the heroics of the pioneer, the generosity of the trader, the benefits brought to the Indian. We have a different viewpoint. Our people in the north lived in a region which was cold and inhospitable. We were nomadic peoples living off the land by hunting and fishing. Land ownership by the individual was unknown, for our people believed that the land belonged to all men. Among these people, the first white man felt immense power and superiority. He said, we were Caesars, there being none to contradict us. The first white trappers came looking for beaver. They brought no tools, metal traps, and above all else, the rifle. After the trappers, the traders, for furs they gave the rifle. The introduction of this one weapon revolutionized our way of life. Old hunting methods were abandoned as our dependence on the rifle increased. Throughout North America, the white man was the sole supplier of this new weapon. In Rupert's Land, the supplier was the Hudson's Bay Company. Because the company had a monopoly over rifle and powder, it could fix the going rate of exchange. If we did not wish to trade, we would lose our means of support. A beaver pelt could fetch a yard of flannel, or a cheap brass kettle, or four spoons. Markups of 300 or 400 percent were common, and there are recorded cases of markups of 2,000 percent. As George Simpson, a 19th century governor of the company, wrote, Philanthropy is not the exclusive object of our visits to these northern regions. The company prospered. Successive governors made personal fortunes and lived in the style of the English gentry. By the 1850s, the company had shipped out of Rupert's Land some 20 million pounds worth of furs. By the 19th century, the company had established trading posts throughout the territory. Each was run by a manager, or a factor as he was then called. The position was not well paid, but many factors had ways of making extra money at our expense, a practice tolerated and even encouraged by the Bay. Short waiting was not uncommon. If the company exchange rate for our rifle was seven beaver pelts, factors often extracted 14, keeping the extra profit for themselves. But such inhuman actions on the part of the company's servants were not the root cause of the Indians' misery and poverty. In the 17th century, two cultures had met head on, and as a result, we had lost our independence, and in so doing, had lost pride in our culture and pride in ourselves. We had no voice in our own land, and in 1869, when a decision was made to sell Rupert's land to the government of Canada, it was the company that made the decision, not us. The land that was uh, taken by the Hudson Bay Company was given to the provinces and then given to the Crown, you know. It's sort of a, a funny kind of a deal, land deal, you know, like uh, selling land that doesn't belong to you. The Indian became the responsibility of the Canadian people in their parliament through various treaties written in English and never understood by the chiefs. The government compelled one tribe after another to sign away their rights to the land. Chief Pasco from the Fort Capel Valley wouldn't sign the treaty not unless they give him the money that Hudson Bay got for selling his valley. And his excuse was there that he just invited the Hudson Bay to stay there, and then they sold the land, the valley, to the Queen of England for 300,000 pounds. 
the original occupiers of Canada, we found ourselves pushed into the isolated areas, unwanted by the white men. Apart from these reserves, we received little compensation. The first treaty made here, Lord Selkirk negotiated the terms of a treaty with my great-great-grandfather, Chief Pegwis. And uh, them times, of all they got in that treaty was a, a hundred pounds of tobacco. But it would not be quite fair to say that we never received further compensation. In fact, each treaty Indian was given three dollars a year. He also received some material goods. A couple of balls of twine, a certain amount of ammunition. For convenience sake, only money payments are made today. The sum of three dollars has been adjusted accordingly, and now every treaty Indian receives from Her Majesty's government a grand total of five dollars a year. 2051, Now the fact is that treaty Indians live on the reserve, they get all their money every year from the government, Non-treaty Indians live off the reserve, they don't get any money. Now, I'll never forgive my grandfather for moving off the reserve because it must be really nice having five bucks a year coming in regularly, eh? It is a pathetic handout. Any pretense of real compensation has gone. Now it is merely a symbolic gesture. Symbolic because it is a yearly reminder to us of who controls the money and who holds the power. Thank you very much. Or you want your own, just your own? In the north, like here at Dipper Lake in North Saskatchewan, many live by hunting, trapping, and fishing. A traditional way of life with traditional problems, hunger and disease. A life of hard work and no luxuries. Indians don't have to stay on the reserve. Legally, we are free to leave the land, move into the cities, and enjoy the same opportunities as any white Canadian. But to do so, we would have to abandon a culture thousands of years old for the dubious benefit of modern city life. To many of us, the white man's world seems an absurd, frightening, and impersonal place where people lose their humanity and nature is destroyed in the name of economic progress. The government may solemnly acknowledge our right to retain the Indian way of life, but so far it has only attempted to solve our problems by integration. After all, we are a very small minority group, and minorities must learn to adapt. The fact that we were the original inhabitants of Canada, and the fact that we opened up this country for the white man is past history of no material importance today. The Indian is an anachronism, a social misfit. If we will not conform, we must suffer the consequences. And the consequences are appalling. Indians are the lowest income earning group in Canada. Three quarters of the Indian families earn less than $2,000 per year. One third of the Indians are totally dependent on welfare. The infant mortality rate is more than twice the national average. Life expectancy, 36 years, is one of the lowest in the world. In short, life for us has become worse since the arrival of the white man. But what of the Hudson's Bay? How does the Honorable Company fare today? The 
the bay is proud possessor of a large chain of department stores throughout the country and has a yearly turnover which has reached $500 million. But it has not forgotten its original trading partners. Most stores carry our handicrafts. And of course the company still deals in furs. Most of the wild pelts that go to make up these coats come from the north, where the trappers are still the Indian and the Eskimo. The price the company pays per pelt is low, and the average trapper earns only $500 a year. In other words, his yearly income is equivalent to the markup on a single coat. But if the company won't pay a better price, why don't we take our furs to another buyer? This is a company trading post in Shamatawa, Manitoba, one of over a hundred in Indian and Eskimo communities scattered throughout the north. Almost invariably, the company store is the only store, the only place we can sell furs and buy what we need from the outside world. This virtual monopoly means that the company can even now set the prices of goods it sells, and the prices are high. Many items cost double what they do in the South. Why is it that the lowest income earners in Canada have to pay the highest prices for the goods they buy? We have a standard markup for every item we sell. The standard markup is computed on the markup that is generally accepted for the chain stores in the large centers. And to give you an illustration, a pound of potatoes in Winnipeg, say, costing five cents, will land at Oxford House at 20 cents. Now, this is a terrible difference. It's all in the freight. I challenge anybody on our markups. The worst result of this policy is that the highest freight costs tend to affect the most needed items. The things you buy more, that's where they put the prices on. And the things you buy less, you buy less, that's where they knock the prices out. The high cost of food and the low payment for furs are not the only points of concern. The Bay Store is more than a place to buy and sell. For example, it is usually the local post office with not altogether satisfactory results. My brothers and sisters get their welfare checks uh, through the mail, and so my brothers and sisters tell me, and I have no reason to, to disbelieve what they're saying, that uh, the Hudson Bay manager often uh, simply gets them to sign their welfare check right there at the post office, and they're never allowed to take it out, and then simply will shop for the remaining of their goods at high prices in the store. They're not even allowed to go and shop at the co-op store. I will deny that completely and totally. If we have a man that will do that, he will not be in our organization tomorrow. We get the mail from Sodak or any other uh, for buyers, you know, sending the pri list prices, you know. And the bay manager would put it in a garbage can and burn it. And these, these were supposed to be caving out to the trappers. I've seen it happen more than once. High prices and low income lead to debt. Every customer's name and number is on file. He is almost always allowed credit, but this makes him more dependent on the company. Because of his low earning capacity, it is virtually impossible for the Indian to pay the company back in full. Perpetual debt binds us firmly to the store. And having no money, we have to rely on the bay manager for further credit to buy traps to hunt and food to eat. When a trapper went to the bay store to ask for credit, the bay manager would hardly give him $25. Buy yourself maybe a snare wire or three traps your $25 is gone. And the bay manager expects you to go trapping for a month. 
How can you go trapping with the, with the empty stomach in? The Hudson's Bay Company has almost complete economic control, and through this power governs the lives of our people. But it has no duty towards us. It has no responsibility for our welfare. This is a free country, and the Hudson's Bay is free to strike the best bargain it can. The social problems caused are someone else's headache. Our position in any of these communities now is simply the storekeeper. We're there to provide the requirements and the wants to the community. I had the experience recently for the first time of visiting a remote reserve and uh, one in which the Hudson Bay was the only company. <laughs> but the fact was very visible that the Indians were poverty stricken, they were dependent, and their culture was, was very much threatened. That was a reality. That's where we are, and it isn't working. We are purely and simply storekeepers in these areas. It is not our authority to do anything. It is the government's responsibility through the Department of Indian Affairs, the Department of Northern Affairs. <clears throat> this is nothing to do with the Hudson's Bay Company. We are storekeepers just the same as in the city of Winnipeg. The role of Hudson Bay Company, which is totally irres uh, irresponsible. What is needed for, for this first step of the solution is that an enterprise that is more responsible, more responsive to the people needs, not just the making profits. Alphonse Dorian, Indian trapper. These days, a large part of his income comes from the sale of fish. He sells the fish through a local cooperative. This is Pelican Narrows in North Saskatchewan. Also, Pelican Narrows lies in one of the richest trapping belts in Canada. The overkill of wildlife, encouraged in the past by the company's desire for vast quantities of fur, has left its mark, and now there are strict government regulations on what can be trapped and when. But the Hudson's Bay has never controlled the fishing industry. And in this area, the local cooperative has done well for its members. Under this system, Alphonse gets a fair price for his fish. But even so, it is a constant struggle and many of the new generation are leaving the land breaking family and traditional ties. Is there any future for this way of life? Can trapping and fishing continue to give us even a bare living? In addition to our present problems, we are faced with a new danger, a new threat to our existence, the result of yet another form of exploitation, pollution. Industry has come to the north, and here the Hudson's Bay Company has a built-in advantage. When it sold our land to the government, the company retained certain mineral rights which it is now exploiting. Industry is finishing off what the rifle began, the destruction of the ecological balance by laying waste the land and poisoning the waters for miles around. Now it stands to reason that since the Indian people are living primarily on hunting and trapping and fishing and all this type of thing, that as big business moves in, the game would be receding into the real outer fringes and the native people, the aboriginal, will be caught between the hunt and industry. And so they will be going into industry to live the poverty life that we see down in the south. 
And this is inevitable that it is going to happen because there's not enough jobs to be created for the Aboriginal up in the north. Churchill, Manitoba. This township was originally a settlement of the Chippewan people. In the 1930s, when free traders were beginning to move into the area, the Hudson's Bay moved its trading post from here to Little Duck Lake some 80 miles northwest. The Chippewan people were encouraged to follow. In 1956, the company abandoned its post at Little Duck Lake because it was no longer profitable to run. So, the Chippewans are back in Churchill on welfare, deserted by the company on which they had been encouraged to depend for nearly 300 years. For these people and their families, the future looks hopeless. It was tragic in Churchill, where people have been moved forcefully into Churchill to be left there. Big business is not going to go in there to help train and give these people a better life. It's impossible for them to do it. And Mid-Canada Development, big industrialist, says that we haven't got the time to do that. They'd better hire their lawyers and they'd better get the government to look after their welfare. Industry has never benefited us. It has never given us work. It has only brought destruction. The Queen continues on her rounds of duty. This time, it's a centennial celebration in Manitoba. The Indian is here, brought out, dressed up, and put on parade. By the way, does everybody know what a reservation is? A uh, reserve is where the government reserves Indians, because they never know when they may need one to pray before the queen or some other very important foreigner, right? since our forefathers signed treaties with Her Majesty Queen Victoria. It is with sorrow that we note that the promises of peace and harmony, of social advancement and equality of opportunity have not been realized by our people. I am sure you will note on your visits to Indian communities that Indians have not in effect profited well by the prosperity of this great and wealthy nation. We are hopeful that Your Majesty's representatives will now, through belated, recognize the inequities of the past and will take steps to redress the treatment of the Indian people of Manitoba. There may be some people who think that um, by appealing to a queen or um, the great mother or whoever, well, whatever you want to call her, um, thinking that you might get something out of it. Actually, you might be getting peanuts. And... You have my best wishes for a happy and prosperous future as you take advantage of modern material developments without losing the best of your old traditions and culture. May God bless you all, and may the days of peace and happiness be as sure as the course of the sun in the sky.
The whole idea was to make the Indian very dependent upon the Hudson Bay Company so that they could control him very precisely for the purpose of collecting furs. And of course, this was done very effectively by making him understand that uh, he really could not make a living in any other way but then uh, through the fur trade business. Now, surely, I don't think that it is quite fair to put all the blame for the Indian ills at the feet of the Hudson's Bay Company. You know, when you had the complete monopoly, the total, absolute, dictatorial, totalitarian control, you didn't do anything for them in education. Is it not true that the Indian has been under the jurisdiction of the federal government uh, since 18, 1870? I mean, surely for the last hundred years you cannot uh, blame the Hudson's Bay Company that there are not schools for the Indians to attend. Education doesn't have to be only in the strictly formal sense. There could have been all kinds of other, other things that uh, may have, could have been developed. What about certain, uh, uh, you know, occupations, uh, trades and crafts and so on? Rankin Inlet, an Eskimo community. A cooperative has found work for its members outside the basic fishing trapping economy. The production of crafts may not be a solution to the Eskimo's economic problems, but it keeps him in contact with his traditions, giving him a sense of identity, a source of pride. For a people to survive and grow, it is essential that they retain pride in their culture. is reserve. Preparations are being made for a powwow. Like the Eskimo, we have seen our culture attacked and almost completely destroyed. We started with not knowing too much about the culture. Some of the older people had seen the dances, and uh, from what I can gather, uh, one old fella told me that the last time that he'd seen our people dance was 65 years ago. Our dancing was uh, forbidden by the government and the churches in the olden days, some of the old fellas tell me. Uh, they were not allowed to do them because the church and the government says you don't do those things. And uh, this is why one of the reasons why our dances died. Oh. Need another one over here. Yeah, yeah but you leave a spot over there. One of your girls over here. Today it's still considered by the older people as something sacred in their own minds. The younger people, it's more a pride thing. A pride in their, in their brown skin, if you want. Pride in their feeling as Indians, whether they, uh, they happen to drive Cadillacs or uh, 52 Chev. They're here, you know. The fact is they're here and they, they, they want to express something. You know, let's, let's really look at this whole business of our culture. Let's look at it from every aspect and let's uh, start talking about it like we're doing today. And let's try and understand it. And once we, we develop an understanding of how it operates and how it works within our lives as individuals and within our lives collectively, then we'll be able to develop some sort of uh, movement or mobilization of our own people. We can help each other tremendously.
And I don't think that anybody else can at this point. You know, I think it's going to be up to, entirely up to the Indian people themselves. And it's going to be up to the young people to get together and say, look, we're the only ones that are going to get ourselves out of this jackpot because the white man is, ain't going to do it for us. For many of us, the Hudson's Bay Company is the main bone of contention. We have been conquered as natives. We have been colonized and we are still under the control of that same company. The only way we'll ever get out of it is through national liberation movement. Therefore, I say in the 300th year, under the festivities and propaganda that's going out, that we should be radicalizing and revolutionizing our brothers and sisters so that we will move and mobilize to take over these stores and the company. Take them over, of course it means we will have to seize them. We don't expect the Hudson Bay Company to give them to us, that's for sure. But they are our property. We paid for it many times over. And I think it's time that we simply made it our property in a physical sense. Now, the reason that we have to do this is not necessarily that we want to take over the Hudson Bay stores. They're not such great industries for us and won't employ that many people. But the thing is, the Hudson Bay personnel are the key people in decision-making in our communities, which hold, there's a small white power structure in each of our communities, which holds the power and dominate us. The National Indian Brotherhood has a different approach by bringing pressure on government, by making people aware, by helping Indians achieve their rights within the framework of the Canadian Constitution. It is slowly bringing about change. Well, I'm in the national office now, and I'm just in the process of uh, having a meeting with uh, Dieter. Are these fellas charging us? Yeah, they're charging us. But in the final analysis, we know that one of the major obstacles to overcome is the economic domination of the Hudson's Bay. Hopefully, I suppose the best thing that could happen would be for the Indian people to take over all the Hudson Bay stores in the north and run them themselves. The Hudson's Bay Company has been with us for more than 300 years. Its progress through the centuries can be viewed as an outstanding success story. From the humble beginnings, it has grown to become one of the richest mercantile companies in the world. We see the Hudson's Bay as a symbol of the white man's society, which places so much emphasis on the making of money and when we speak out against the company, we question the whole social, political, and economic system which helps it flourish. We see that while the Bay grew rich, the Indian remained in desperate poverty, and many successive government, many generations of Canadians stood by and allowed that to happen. In 1971, a special Senate committee reporting on poverty in Canada had this to say. Clearly, we have failed to do right by our native peoples, and their plight is a blot on Canada's record and a cause for shame for all Canadians. I pity the country, I pity the state, and the mind of a man who thrives on hate. Small are the lies of cheats and of liars, of bigoted news press, fascist town crier. Deception annoys me, deception destroys me. The Bill of Rights throws me, in jails they all know me. Frustrated our churchmen, saving a soul man. The tinker, the tailor, the colonial governor, they pull and they pawn me, they're seeking to draw me away from the roundness of the life. Civil servants, they 
thrive off my body Their trip is with power Back bacon and welfare Please they arrest me Materialist to test me Pollution that chokes me Movies they joke me Politicians exploit me City life jades me Hudson they fleece me Hunting laws throw me Government is bumbling Revolution's rumbling To be ruled in impunity There's tradition continuity I pity the country I pity the state And the mind of a man Who thrives on hate 